Uh, the meeting tonight is open to the public for in-person attendance at the Capitola City Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue if anyone's out there and would like to attend. The meeting is also cablecast live on Spectrum Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 77 and Spectrum Channel 25. This meeting can also be viewed live from the city's website www.cityofcapitola.org or watched on the city's web website anytime following the meeting's adjournment. Our technician tonight is Brian Robinson. And as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones. And we will start with the roll call. Commissioner Esty. Present. Commissioner Jensen. Present. Commissioner Wilk. Here. Vice Chair Christensen. Here. And Chair Westman. Here. And now we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and the next item on our agenda is oral communications. And oral communications are for short comments from the public about items that are not on tonight's agenda. And um, uh, if you would like to have your name included in the minutes, uh, you're welcome to sign the sheet that's on the podium and we will include your name. So is there anyone who would like to Speak to us about an item not on tonight's agenda. I don't see anyone. Um, so do we have any commission comments? I have a commission comment, being a commissioner. Uh, so there's a lot of um, uh, residential applications on tonight's agenda, and it, it brought to mind a topic that um, I had brought up to this commission in the past, and maybe, it, maybe it's something that if I can get some sort of interest interest in, we might want to put it on in a future agenda. And that has to do with the color and material board. So all these applications they are asked, uh, say, okay, for, for residences, it says, okay, well, what color are you painting your house? And what materials are you using? And it occurs to me that, well, certainly anybody can paint their house, whatever color they want and change their siding um, without approval of a planning commission, unless of course it's a, brand new remodel or a new new um, new application. So my thought is that, well, maybe the notion of looking at a material board and colors and materials might make sense for a large commercial project, but not for residential projects. There, there aren't any municipal standards for what are acceptable paints in the, in the village or in the, uh, in the residences, or is there material standards? They're there just, I don't know why they're there. Um, you know, it occurs to me that, well, perhaps you have your application approved and you decide at the last minute you want, you don't want to paint it that color. Um, does that mean you have to apply, reapply for your application because now all of a sudden you're not doing it to print? It just seems to um, be an unnecessary irritant to the, applicate, to the ap applicant to have that requirement. And it might also influence their decision as to what materials they use or what colors they choose because they want to be safe and get their project approved. So they'll use, you know, they won't paint it polka dot like they initially planned. So I would like you guys, since we have a whole new group of people since last time I brought this up, uh, maybe you guys can think about that. And uh, if it tickles your fancy, maybe we can bring that up at a, a future agenda. Thank you. Okay, anyone else have any comments tonight? Uh, I actually have one. Um, I'm sorry I missed the last planning commission meeting. Me too. Um, and uh, it looks like the item was continued and is going to be coming back. So I have a couple requests of staff. Uh, when it comes back, 
Uh, I would like you to include in the packet the communications that I received from the city attorney regarding my request to consider employment and the preferences of people living um, in those units. And um, I would also like some information on how this affordable project is going to work. We're making all of these exceptions because someone says, I have an affordable project. And um, for me, I, I just want a little understanding of who's running that affordable project, how it's going to work. Is it the housing authority? Because I understand they're involved. Is it the developer? Just some general information on how the project is going to work in our community. Thank you. Um, are there any staff comments? Good evening, Chair and Planning Commissioners. Um, staff comments tonight will be from me and Katie. My comment is that there will be communications being sent out. Some of you attended our commissioner workshop this week regarding um, onboarding training for new commissioners. And we went over some of the requirements of new commissioners, like training requirements and code of conduct and different forms that apply. So staff will be communicating the requirements to you this week via email. So please keep an eye out for that. As a reminder, there is a training requirement for the planning commission. It's state mandated ethics training. So communications will be going out to you regarding that training and how to complete it as well as which forms need to be turned in and by which dates. So just keep an eye out for that email, hopefully tomorrow, maybe Monday, but it will be headed your way soon. Oh, and another reminder I wanted to share is that per state regulations during COVID, there were changes made to the Brown Act, which impact open meetings and how they can be conducted. And that's how we were able to use Zoom for commissioner attendance during these meetings. But with the declaration of emergency ended by the governor at the end of February, that will change how commissioners and council members can attend remote meetings in the future. Because the rules are reverting back to original statutes as they were prior to COVID, it refers back to the Brown Act before all of this change. So with that, remote attendance will be less convenient to do if commissioners wish to attend meetings remotely, they would need to post an agenda at their location 72 hours prior. Their location would have to be open to the public. So if you're trying to attend the meeting from home, your home address would be published on the agenda, which is a public document. And you must open your front doors to the public to allow them to join you in your home as you participate in this <laughs> meeting. So it's an option. And if that's something you are interested in pursuing, we can discuss it. It would just ask that you reach out to staff I'm including myself to make sure that we're following the Brown Act requirements. However, um, the main, you know, the easier way to do this is to refer back to how we were doing things prior to COVID, which would mean in-person attendance. And that is kind of the intention of the Brown Act is to conduct meetings in an open setting and in person. So members of the public will still be able to attend meetings via Zoom and participation for members of the public is still permitted via Zoom. It's really just attendance on the part of the commissioners or the city council. And it's not prohibitive if you are in an instance where you cannot attend a meeting in person, we can address feasible options to make sure you're still able to attend remotely. But like I said, the requirement is that the location of the meeting is agendized 72 hours prior, the actual address of the location must be included and an agenda must be posted at that address as well so that members of the public can attend in both locations should the need arise. If there are any questions about the ruling, so it's um, Assembly Bill 361 and the Brown Act, which is the Open Public Act for meetings. If there are any questions about that, myself and the city attorney would be happy to answer them. Um, just send me an email or give us a call or drop into City Hall to visit me during business hours. Okay, thank you, Julia. Um, and I've just got a couple other updates for you. Um, for item 5B117 Saxon, you should have received an email on that yesterday. So there was one additional material. Um, also, um, at the last public meeting, we had a long discussion about whether or not you could increase the noticing. And just following the meeting and looking at the Muni Code, there's definitely a section that says the Community Development Department um, can provide additional notice as determined necessary or desirable. So 
um, for just wanted to highlight that, that at the time of the meeting, I was unable to look into our new code, but we definitely have a section allowing for that. And um, so we'll revisit that at this time. Um, we haven't, we don't know when that item will come back, but we'll, we'll make sure to talk with the chair about re-noticing prior. And then also, um, I just want to give you a quick update on our outdoor dining. As you know, many of the outdoor dining um, locations were wiped out during the storm. And right now, our policy has been, because there's um, a decrease in the amount of overall parking in the village, we've asked those who had dining decks that were destroyed not to bring back the temporary um, or, um, and to move forward with their prototype design. So right now, we do have one building application in for, the, for Britannia Arms, and we do have, um, I've seen signed contracts, and I know that deposits have been made with a local landscape architect. So I do know that he's working on many designs right now, but we're just waiting for them to come into the city. So, um, and then the two dining decks that are existing um, that did not get wiped out in the storm, as long we're also seeing that their applications are moving forward. So we're allowing those to stay up until the prototype design is ready to be built. <coughs> so those are my staff updates for you this evening. So on the noticing, we don't need the permission of the applicant? No, um, it, it's it's pretty open and it's based on as necessary. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I will give one piece of advice to my fellow uh, commissioners. When you take the ethics training, it doesn't matter if you get 100%. What matters is how long you spend taking it. So if you go too quickly, even if you get 100%, they send you a notice and say you have to do additional training because you didn't spend enough hours doing it. So, so the requirement is two hours. So my <laughs> advice is don't sign off and say you're done until your two hours are up or you'll get a notice to do more training. I should have talked to you. <laughs> I was an hour and 58 minutes and it pushed me all the way back to the end. Uh -huh. It took me a little over two hours, so. Yeah, good for lucky. you. Yeah, like... <laughs> uh, it took me a little less than two hours and they came back to me. Okay, the next item is the approval of the minutes for January 25th. And I will need to recuse myself because I was not in attendance of that meeting. So do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move approval of the Planning Commission meeting minutes of January 25th. I'll second that. Okay, can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Aye. 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 Okay, the next item is the consent calendar. Uh, the consent calendar is considered by the Planning Commission to be routine and will be enacted in one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion on these items prior to the time that the Planning Commission votes on the action unless members of the public or the Planning Commission request specific items to be discussed for separate review. Uh, so we have one item tonight. It's 524 Pilgrim Drive. Uh, it's a design permit for a single story addition and remodel. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to pull this item for discussion? No one. Is there anyone on the commission who would like to pull it? Okay, I believe we have a commissioner who is going to recuse himself, uh, Commissioner Jensen, and so I'm looking for a motion and a second on the consent calendar. I move the consent calendar. I second. Okay, can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Ashton. Aye. Commissioner Wells. Aye. Commissioner Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, now we're gonna move on to our public hearings. And the first public hearing is 203 Esplanade. Uh, it is uh, for a window replacement at Zelda's restaurant, and we'll have a staff report. Okay, um, can you hear me? No. Can we can, but I'm not certain. Okay. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Brian, can you hear me? 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 Can you hear
Brian's pulling up the slideshow. Um, this is a, and we added this item at the last minute. It's for an emergency coastal development permit for um, Zelda's restaurant at 203 Esplanade. I'll, I'll jump into it um, without the slides at this point. So as you know, Zelda's restaurant was recently impacted by the storms. And the rear wall uh, that faces the ocean uh, was severely damaged, and there was structural damage to that wall. Our building official, after reviewing um, the preliminary analysis from the structural engineer, asked that they do further demolition in order to get further into the wall um, and see exactly what was going on structurally. So in doing that, they took out, um, the windows have been taken out. There's, uh, I think some of the, um, there's some boards that are still up, but there, there's very, very little left to those walls at this point. The applicant, when they opened the walls, um, approached staff asking, um, if they could change the system on the window system on the rear walls. So they would like to utilize um, a, a, a window system that is a sliding window system. And there, there's a series of three different sections within the rear wall, some with three window panels and I believe two with four window panels. So they want to keep the amount of panels within each section so it will have a, the same like look and feel to the back wall but um, have a different function. Um, and the sliders will allow more air to be in the restaurants. And we know after COVID, uh, there is a preference to having more air within restaurants. And so here's the, here we go. Um, so here's the, uh, on the slide here, you can see a picture of Zelda's after the storm and the boarded up windows. And, if, and the reason we're here tonight is I'm, as the community development director, I'm allowed to issue emergency coastal development permits. This one, because it's tied to a historic structure, I would like to have the Planning Commission give guidance on because I will have to come back for a, um, an alteration permit for a historic structure. So this, this is just preliminary guidance so the applicant knows how to put together their application for this future. Um, and if they were to move forward with ordering the windows, it's at their own risk until this will come back at your next meeting for an alteration permit. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so here's a picture of uh, the impacts to the storm. You can see that wall is bowing inside and the impacts to that. So those windows have been removed there's essentially very very little left along that rear wall. Next slide. Um, this image is showing the uh, 1940s to 1960s photo. We're not exactly sure of the date. And then a more recent photo. Um, and listed on top is from our historic statement um, or <coughs> for Capitola and describing, it doesn't just describe one of the structures, it describes the whole um, block for the Esplanade, and that should say 199 through 231 Esplanade is an eclectic Capitola Esplanade. <laughs> and it describes it as evolving, the structures evolving since the 1920s to its present con configuration. And the reason for its ev evolution is based on uh, different ownership as well as Storm, periodic storm damage, which we <coughs> most recently saw. So, and it also uh, notes that the bandstand is the oldest continuing operation. So 
as you can see, there have been modifications over time to this building. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the, the very clear change in the windows and, and how they were previously and the change of um, to what they are now. Uh, next slide, please. So the transom windows on the top, the applicant would like to remove. Next slide, please. Um, this is showing the three different sections where they'd like to have sliding windows. Um, it would be that repeat ribbon design. They would match the number of window openings in each section. Next slide, please. And actually, if you can go back, sorry. Around the door, they would still have fixed windows on either side of the door, and they would replace the door, but it, it would look similar to what it is today. Um, and then the last part of the request is to raise the sill height four inches. This is to align with the table heights within the dining room, but it, it could also help with future storms, just giving them a little more protection. Next slide, please. Um, between the windows right now, there's a four inch um, trim. That with this new sliding system would be decreased to two inches. Um, I know the applicant is here, the owner of Zelda is Jill Ailey, and she has been looking around for other solutions to this. We Originally, I requested this to be at four inches to match, but um, she's not been able to locate a match for that system. Next slide, please. So tonight, I'm asking for direction on three items. Is it okay to lower the sill height? Or to, I'm sorry, raise. Uh, to raise the sill height um, four inches. And then can, would you like them to replicate the existing windows as they are today, or is it okay for the new sliding window system and to remove the, the windows above? And then if there is support for the sliding windows, is the two inch aluminum mullions okay? Or would you like to see the four, a four inch alternative be found? So with that, um, this isn't a, an item that's been posted for public hearing. It's, we're really looking for direction. The applicant is here to answer any questions. And the outcome of this is what I'll base my emergency CDP on. All right, thank you. Does anybody have any questions of staff? Uh, it looks like Jill's here. So would you like to speak to us? No, about? I thought Katie did a great job. <laughs> well, the only thing I was worried about that you said is if, they, if I order the windows at my own risk, so in a month from now, I would hope to be open almost. Yeah. 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 So tonight we're really looking for direction on this design so that Jill can order the proper windows, and then we'll come back with an application to be approved. All right. Well, I'd be happy to jump in if no one uh, wants to. Go, Peter. In my opinion, the historical nature of this building is the fact that it's there. <laughs> um, there are no significant architectural features that impress me as uh, historical. Um, it needs to be um, a seaside business that the public can have access to and enjoy, and that's kind of it. So, you know, my opinion would be whatever works for you, I would be all for. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, I would. I would agree with Peter. I think uh, the sliding idea is good because you get more ventilation, as as uh, director pointed out. That's good in these years of endemics with COVID, et cetera. Moving the sill up makes sense too. I don't know why it was down lowered in the first place. Yeah, the tables brought over the window mm -hmm. sill, so it was just. I guess people were stuff. shorter in the twenties. <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 and I, the four inch versus two and one sixteenth. I don't see it. that makes a huge difference in the design. Commissioner Jensen? I would just echo both comments. <clears throat> I agree as well. I think it'll make it a, a really nice airy environment in there, having it operable. Yeah, I agree as well. I think the sliding windows would be a nice addition to it. Uh, obviously, the back of this building's been destroyed and remodeled, and there's not much historic left except what Peter said, the fact that it's there. Uh, so uh, I would be in favor of the new sliding window system. Uh, when the application came back for a formal review, I, I would add a condition in there just so we make certain that everyone's aware that that deck back there is a public access. It's in our local coastal plan, and that needs to remain open to the public. But other than that, I think it's a great idea. Great. Thank you. 
So do you have your direction? Yes, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to item B, which is 117 Saxon Avenue. It's a design permit to legalize an internal attic conversion located in the R1 zoning district. So I have to recuse myself. Do you want me to leave? I think you probably should leave okay. since we're gonna discuss it. Call me back. We will call you back. Chair Westman, I just had, I, I received a text from one of our consultants that will be presenting tonight, and mm -hmm. they're saying there's an audio issue with our Zoom out to the public. So I'd like to take a moment to sure. resolve that. So we'll take a five minute recess while they work on that, or however long it takes. Thank you. Okay. if I just sign her. <laughs> well, I never read that one, so... I <laughs> Would you want to correct yourself with the next... Yeah, this, yeah, this is just what they gave me, and I went, this is not right. This is... <laughs> Well, uh, maybe we can get Julia to give you an update, update in the next five minutes. Can you correct it? Did you want to correct it? No, it's correct. Testing, what testing, correct. testing. What you were reading was incorrect. Oh, all those years? <laughs> all those years. All those years. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe we've resolved the issue. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, we're back to our meeting and having a staff presentation on 117 Saxon Avenue. Yeah, thank you, Chair Westman. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, so we have a design permit for 117 Saxon Avenue. Uh, this is uh, a, a remedy to um, some work that was done without the benefit of permit. Uh, I've got a, just an aerial just to give you some context. This is on the corner of Saxon Avenue and El Salto Drive. And a little more context, this building, according to our records, was originally built in 1910. Uh, it's noted as a one and a half story. It's got this uh, low profile dormer at the front. And uh, the attic space is inside uh, what you see as the steeper roof pitches. And so specifically, this is an area uh, that covers 574 square feet. It's within the original constructed attic. Uh, and the, the background that we have um, more recently and what brings us to today in this permit request is in December of 2021, the city received a complaint about uh, a window and privacy and whether or not this area was uh, legal to be uh, habitable, conditioned space. Uh, we did an, an investigation, uh, dug up some records, both with, through the city and the county. Uh, we reached out to the owner in March of 2022 um, and the owner did not have any further records and, and we shared what we had and our findings. Uh, and I think after figuring out s several of the paths forward, uh, the owner agreed that uh, filing a design permit was the, the way to go, uh, hired a local designer and made a submittal in October, 2022. So uh, this is just a site plan view. The uh, shaded tan area is the attic above. This is representative of the first floor uh, and the site boundaries. And then this is what was that shaded area in the prior slide. So this has uh, got essentially a vaulted and sloping ceiling throughout, uh, runs along the, the cross length ridge of the, the roof. I'm gonna use the pointer here. I'll point out those glass blocks that were in that uh, front elevation that we looked at, the low profile uh, dormer. And then here's the window that uh, generated uh, at least a portion of the original uh, concern that was uh, filed with the city. Um, the window really is kind of the, the primary topic here because um, technically it's a design review, but we're not really looking at anything design related other than this window. 
Um, we did some investigation, uh, as noted. We were not able to date the window, uh, so we don't really know if it was part of the original construction or if it was added with this modification. Uh, but where we landed in terms of a, a nexus and looking at this from a mitigation standpoint was that the area is being activated and so it, it does present a new potential privacy issue. And so we are recommending a condition that uh, the lower half of the window receive a, a treatment for um, privacy. And that's condition number 13. And so here is just a real life view of this window. Uh, it faces generally south. Um, Toward the, toward the sea, and um, the property next door, most closest to the window, uh, you can't even see the home here because it's uh, the way that that lot was developed, that home was uh, really tight to the rear property line. So it has a, um, a bit of a view over the, what is the front yard. Um, I, this, this is just a bit of cleanup uh, on our recommended condition uh, in preparing the this slideshow today, uh, I look, took a closer look at this window and there's actually five vertical divided lights. So the, the check rail, which is the bottom cross piece of the, the fixed window, the upper portion of the fixed window, uh, there's only two uh, divided lights in there and there's three on the bottom. So bottom half is a little bit, uh, you know, would just present an immediate question for this condition. Uh, I added it in parentheses in the written condition in the staff report for clarification, but in fact, it makes it more confusing. So just want to modify that on record here and just say at the check rail and below. So that would be all three level, all three, three pane, three. horizontal. And that window opens? Yeah, the, the, the three pane portion is operable. So with that, um, we did receive a, an email uh, from the neighbor that uh, has the, the property that this window faces, uh, their front yard, and uh, they were supportive of staff's recommendation, and I do believe the applicant is here and, and wants to discuss the item as well. Thank you. Does anybody have any commissioners have any questions of the staff? Oh. Uh, the applicants here, would you like to address us? Please. <laughs> okay. um, good evening. My name is John Shank. I, I'm the, my wife and I are the owners of the home here at 117 Saxon. It's kind of echoey. <laughs> um, I first want to apologize in that I addressed the letter to you all incorrectly. I think it's too early in the year for the city's website to have updated and it. Yeah. You don't show his chair. <laughs> That's okay, don't worry about that part. Well, my apologies. Um, I wanna thank staff, especially Katie and Brian for their professional courtesy, caring, communication, helping us kind of work through the, how did this happen sort of a moment that we had a year ago or so. Um, we appreciate staff's recommendation. We take no issue with it. it Whenever this happened, we don't really know. We've tried to look and figure out when. I know that it's been a bedroom for at least 20 years, um, but we can't really figure out what happened before that. When we bought the home in 2007, we did what I think is pretty normal diligence. Our lender did diligence, the brokers, the seller's disclosures I looked through. It, nothing, it's just been a bedroom. Um, I think, um, you know, commissioners, you guys may recall from a year ago or so, um, the second story side yard roof deck issue that was before you all um, that sort of became this um, complaint about the, the privacy issue. And I think my, my, our request is that we not, I don't know, frost or, or treat the window. I've looked at the street very carefully, there's not a second story south facing window that has a treatment, um, even all the way to Escalona. And then I looked around, I couldn't find frosted windows anywhere. Um, as you saw in the photo, our window is over the front yard. It's not even at the house. And as I tried to point out in my letter, I thought, you know, they, they it's a beautiful new home. It's a brand new home, a few years old. Um, and they cited it and floor planned it and all of those things knowing, hey, there's that house with that bedroom window. 
doesn't mean it's right. We were here because it, there's a there's a lack of compliance, and we want to get that corrected. But the light and air and the view, the peekaboo view that everybody loves to enjoy when they can, is something that we very much value, and we'd like to be able to keep that. Um, I intended to provide a few extra photos if they were helpful. I happened to send you the same one multiple times, um, and I brought a few other photos if, if those are interesting or helpful. But with that, I'll stop. Um, but I guess my one other request would be, if you do find that the right thing to do is to require the frosting, I mentioned to Brian, I was gonna ask, I think in the recommendation it says that we would um, do that within seven days. And my request, you know, for us to figure out what materials and procure them and get somebody and get it all done. It, these days it feels like a miracle to get anything done in a week. But um, if we could have more time or maybe tie it to the, there's a building permit process we're gonna have to go through after this and just tie the work together if you really think we need to do it. Um, I just, I, I, there's a part of me that worries, that worries, I shouldn't be worrying about other people, but it does feel that in my homework of, of the, your city's municipal code, et cetera, when looking at the roof deck issues, it seemed that there were very, very clear categories of where, of privacy expectations. And the front yard was the least expectation compared to backyards and side yards, et cetera. And I just thought, you know, if Anytime somebody gets a permit, if somebody gets to say, well, I don't like that one, we're gonna have frosted windows all over the place. And I don't think it's great. Just to, as I noticed that there were none, um, but I'll stop there. And of course, answer any questions if you guys have any. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Does anyone have any questions you wanna ask the applicant now? Okay. Thank you. We will bring this item back to the commission for a discussion. Uh, Is there anybody else in the public who wants to? Oh, sorry. Is there anyone else in the public? Thank you for reminding me. Anybody else in the public want to speak on this? Seeing no one, we'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, who would like to start with this one? <laughs> <laughs> you looking my way, I'll be happy to jump in. So I think um, that um, the fact that we allow second stories in this community, um, right off the bat, is gonna be a problem with privacy because there's gonna be very few second stories that don't have windows. And I was actually kind of surprised staff recommended the frosting because that is, to me, is a slippery slope. This window does not look directly into anybody else's anything. It overlooks a yard which like, as he points out, all windows over gonna, are going to overlook something. So I just, I'm just uh, hard pressed to see why we would put any conditions on that window, especially since, uh, and, and this really doesn't ap apply, but I mean, it's, a, it's an ocean facing window. And, you know, that's why we're here as we like to <laughs> look out at even if it's a peak or even if it's the clouds, you wanna look out and, and if it inadvertently overlooks someone's rose garden and you wanna bring out your binoculars and count the aphids, I suppose anybody could do that. But um, I just don't think this is, uh, this is something that we should put any conditions on and, and I would, uh, I would uh, pr uh, support deleting condition 13 entirely. Anyone else like to make any comments? Commissioner Christensen? I agree with uh, Commissioner Welk wholeheartedly. And I'm curious as to what, um, have we ever required anybody else, any other applicant to have frosted windows? Yes, we have. With, with, within a setback? Okay, so I just, I, can we see the site plan one more time? Just stuff. Okay, yeah, I, I echo Commissioner Wilkes' sentiments exactly. Commissioner Jensen? Um, when you said um, that it's been required in other projects, can, can you elaborate on where that, generic, where that's been and when that came in issue? I, I can comment on that. So um, we have seen this on prior projects 
I think typically it's been when a new house goes in next to an existing home and there's windows in close proximity for privacy and also within bathrooms. We've mm -hmm. typically asked that uh, many bathrooms have the opaque. Thank you. So I'll actually make a comment on this one. Peter and I don't often agree, but I agree with you on oh, this. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, clearly uh, this has been there for at least 20 years because the people have occupied the house that long. And so it's, it's nothing new. And um, uh, I could um, go along approving the application without requiring them to frost the window. So with that, I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendations and, and with the deletion of condition 13. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. A roll call vote. Commissioner Duncan? Aye. Commissioner Aye. 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 Okay, so someone should let Paul know where he can. You can come back in the room. So I'm going to leave for this one. The one I'll okay. go. I have to read these. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the next item on our agenda is 1555 Lincoln Avenue. It's a design permit, historical alteration permit and variance for an addition to a historical single family residence and the demolition of a non-historic accessory structure. So. Thank you and good evening. So as mentioned, this application includes a design permit, historic alteration permit and variance for a single family residence. It's located at 1555 Lincoln Avenue within the single family residential zoning district. This is the existing residence as it appears today, located within the Jewel Box neighborhood near Wharf Road. The applicant is proposing first and second story additions to the historic primary residence. The project would also, as mentioned, include the demolition of a large accessory structure in the rear yard that was constructed, constructed excuse me, in 1984. This is not historic. This is the proposed site plan. The additions shaded in blue are located in the back half of the structure. With the totaled first and second story additions, the proposed project uh, equals 1,824 square feet for a floor area ratio or FAR of 57%, which conforms to the maximum FAR of 57% for the lot. The uh, proposed parking are noted in, with those X's there and we'll, we'll come to that at the uh, end of this presentation. This is a rendering of the proposed design. I'll go ahead and go through a side by side of the existing and proposed elevations. Sorry, one moment. This is the front uh, and east facing elevation. It is also the most publicly visible elevation. The bulk of those additions uh, will replace a previous shed roof addition set approximately 24 feet back from the front wall. The exterior cladding on the additions are horizontal wood lap, which are differentiated uh, using wider widths than the original Cladding. This is the right north side elevation. This is the opposite side elevation. 
and this is the proposed and existing rear elevation. This is a photo from the assessor's um, records, uh, circa 1975 of the home. You can notice a few differences here, such as the absence of a uh, balcony fence. So some additional historic context. The resident was, residence was constructed around 1890 in the Greek Revival style. The home was modified in the 1920s with a rear shed roof addition and a 1970s conversion of the front porch covering into a balcony. In 1984, the city approved the construction of a large accessory structure in the back. It required a variance. Um, the project was reviewed by architectural historian Seth Bergstein, who noted the structure retains numerous, sorry, numerous character defining features, including steep gable roof, original entrance, Thank you. I think that should fix it. Thank you. So uh, the project was reviewed by architectural historian Seth Bergstein, who noted the structure retains numerous character defining features, including a steep gable roof, original entrance with top light and side light windows, clapboard siding, and numerous wood detailings throughout the structure. The final design presented and proposed incorporates the summary of recommendations provided by Mr. Bergstein, which were focused on preserving the original openings, differentiation, and reductions to the new massing. Following the incorporation of these, uh, those design changes, which are summarized above, Mr. Bergstein found the overall project in compliance with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, as well as the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. As mentioned before, this project requires or includes two variances. One is for the uh, parking dimensions of the covered space or the garage, as well as the non-conforming calculation or the structural alteration, alteration limitation of 80% of the fair market value. Um, the 80% calculation based on the architect's middle and staff's review was approximately 80%, but just in uh, Good practice, they opted to apply for a variance because it's just an approximation. And sometimes they change when we get to building. Uh, the proposed covered space measures nine feet, five inches wide by 17 feet, eight inches, sorry, 17 feet, eight inches deep. Uh, whereas they typically are required to have a minimum clearance of 10 feet wide by 20 feet deep. Uh, the specific considerations relating to this variance request include the unique circumstances of the historic status and the associated protections within the municipal code as well as CEQA. Strict compliance with the non-conforming code would be contrary to the preservation um, of this structure as the historic elements of it are also the ones that don't comply with code, namely the front and side elevations. Similarly, the reduction of covered parking dimensions reduces forward massing of the addition and enables the preservation of forward first story, a forward first story window on the corner on the south, uh, southeast elevation. The project also complies with all other zoning standards and meets the required number of on-site parking spaces. 
similar exceptions have been granted in association with historic resources such as 124 Central Avenue and more recently 216 Central Avenue. Therefore, staff was able to make findings in support of granting the variance for both requests of the nonconforming calculation and the covered parking dimensions. Included. Are you done? Oh, oh sorry. Almost. Included in the application, <laughs> no problem. Uh, the applicant is proposing to remove up to six trees, four of which are uh, regulated within the city's forest and, and tree ordinance. Uh, they they may not remove up. They may not remove the entirety of those trees, but they're requesting the authorization to do so, uh, just in case it's required for construction. The area of this sort of hedgerow of trees are lo are indicated in orange above, and that that line there to the south of the structure. Uh, the green are all the other trees that they're proposing to preserve, uh, including the most uh, notable oak tree in the front yard. Because of the remaining trees, staff does not believe that this property is likely to uh, be under the minimum required canopy coverage, so we did not include conditions as re uh, pertaining to these removals. And with that, staff recommends approval based on the attached conditions and findings. Thank you. Any questions of staff? The applicant here, would you like to speak to us? Um, I'm Tara Zorovich, we're the owners. Um, yeah, we just decided to follow the rules. Um, we now live in a house that's bigger than this, but we really want to live here, so we were willing to just, you know, downsize a little bit just to be closer to the beach. So, um, yeah, we just followed all the rules in the garage. As Sean said, um, we just had to shrink it to satisfy the historical society. So I think that's that's it. And the house is in, it's not in great condition. Um, it's, the wood is rotted, and so it definitely needs to be done, so. <laughs> Anyway, I just wanted to thank Sean and Brian for their help with the process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the public or on Zoom that would like to comment on this? Okay, seeing no one, we'll bring it to the commission for consideration and deliberation. Uh, would someone like to start? No, I, I think it's a good design. I like the way you've differentiated the new from the old. Um, the only thing I thought was a little strange, but I guess it's not historic looking at the record, is the second uh, railing on the second story balcony is different than the, the fence on the first story. But looking at that picture from 75, that wasn't there anyway, so <laughs> right. it doesn't really matter. No, I, I think it's fine. Commissioner Christian. <clears throat> um, I don't really have a problem with um, the request for the variance of the parking or any of that, I think that it serves its purpose. Um, I had a question about the trees. I just clarification, I think. So they're requesting to remove the green, the, the, on the plan you had the orange. the orange. So the orange is being removed slowly. Okay. And then the green is remaining. Correct. That's, that's, what I have no problem with that. Thank you. Okay, well, I don't have any problem with it either. I think they did a very nice job on their design to maintain sort of the historical character of the building while making it a bit more livable for them. So um, would someone at this end of the table like to make a motion? On uh, this I'll item? motion to approve the project at uh, 1555 Lincoln. Okay. Uh, and that includes the historical alteration permit in the variance. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second that. All right. We have a motion and a second on this project. Commissioner Aye. 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 Uh, so the next item is 517 Oak Drive, and I need to recuse myself from that. So uh, Vice Chair Christensen will take over for this particular item. Uh, 
All right, so item D. Oh, should I wait for Commissioner Weston? <laughs> Item D, 517 Oak Drive. Um, it's a variance for the required parking dimensions to construct a first story additions without meeting current parking standards. The, par the project is located in the R1 single family residential zoning district. Um, do you have a staff presentation? Yes, thank you. So as mentioned, this application uh, only includes a variance, uh, does not include a design permit. Um, it is located in the single family residential zoning district uh, in specifically the Riverview Terrace neighborhood. This is the existing residence as it appears today. To the right of it, uh, I actually did speak with the neighboring property owner and he, he asked that I just mention this, that they have a unusual shared driveway, so to speak. They are separate properties. They serve the separate properties, uh, but they look contiguous and, and that's kind of how they ended up here based on the unusual development pattern of these two separate lots. This is the proposed site plan. Except for the parking, the proposed additions comply with all development standards and would not require even a design permit due to the zoning code exemption for a residential addition not in excess of 400 square feet, not exceeding 15 feet in height and located towards the rear of the structure. If a variance is approved, the applicant could apply for a building permit under this design permit exemption. As shown, the proposed additions would increase the existing structure by approximately 217 square feet. Proposed parking arrangement is shown above. This is what the structure would look like from the front. You can see that while the additions are located behind, there's some prominence over the existing residence. That said, the maximum height of, of everything, including that addition is 13 and a half feet. This is a rendering of the same uh, remodel, but from the rear, the addition is on the left. And as proposed, uh, the additions would exceed 10% of the structure's existing floor area, which uh, means that the use's full parking demand must be provided, including the dimensions of those parking spaces. The use requires two uncovered parking spaces in a tandem configuration such as the one that exists and is uh, proposed. That would mean two parking spaces that each measure at least nine feet wide by 18 feet deep. The variance includes a proposal for two uncovered parking spaces that measure seven feet wide by 16 feet, six inches deep. For context, there's a parcel map above showing a three block area around here, around the surrounding neighborhood. Of all the lots visible above, uh, only six lots are less than 40 feet wide and only one lot is narrower than the subject property. The, lots, the lot is also proportionally smaller than the other lots around it due to that narrow width and Riverview Terrace lots are already among the smallest in Capitola's single family neighborhoods, which is about on average 40 feet wide by 70 feet deep. This lot is 33 and a half feet wide. The applicant also submitted photos of their two vehicles using the approximate area included in the proposal. So you can see what that would look like. The project will comply with, as mentioned before, all other zoning standards and meet the required number of on-site parking spaces. Therefore, staff was able to make findings in support of this variance request. And with that, we are recommending approval based on the attached conditions and findings. A question. Um, so your 
staff's rationale for the variance is basically the size of the lot for the parking variance. Correct. And do we have precedent on this? We've uh, other Riverview Terrace where we've where we've accepted uh, smaller lots. It seems to me we've accepted a lot of them, but I, I don't want to be setting precedent here. There is one example I can think of um, up on Depot Hill on Central Avenue on the, um, the, the side closer to the village, right before, um, gosh, there was, can't remember the address for it, but it was a, it's a really small lot. It has a tan house on it that's about a story and a half, and they came in for a second story addition towards the back, but they couldn't meet their parking requirement, and there was um, a variance granted there because of the size of the lot, but it was also tied to being historic. I'm just channeling Ed Newman here because he always uh, would say, well, why do we have re requirements if we're going to uh, have variances all the time? So I just want to make sure that we've got good rationale for the variance. And I think we do. Well, well the, look beyond that, what did they do on the other three lots that are these skinny lots for parking? Do you know? I, I can't tell you for certain. I, I'm guessing that like many of the other properties along the Soquel Creek, one of the six that I starred on that parcel map is along the creek. I'm assuming it doesn't have parking. The majority don't in that section. Uh, one of the other properties shown is the neighboring property, which has a it has the exact same non-conforming setup. Um, and I'm not sure about the two flanking it on the opposing street. But thank you. But to be clear, we're not losing any parking. It's just right. Yes, it would still be two parking spaces provided that you accepted the um, the arrangement. Does um, the applicant want to come up and speak? Is the applicant here? Hello, hi, I'm uh, Mike Moore. Um, I'm really just kind of here to answer questions. Um, I bought the property with my wife back in 2003, and um, we cherish the village. We rented in two different spots prior to buying, and um, we have a 19-month-old boy now, and we are just humbly looking to add a, uh, a bedroom, and really, uh, and I think our contractors actually uh, might be available on Zoom, but we've been working very, very, very hard for quite a few years to find a solution here. Um, Sean's been very supportive, as have the balance of staff, in kind of guiding us. And um, yeah, so um, I mean, just for clarity, we aren't losing any parking. We're maintaining um, e exactly the status quo as is. Uh, you know, we're demolishing a shed that's in the back and just adding a, a bedroom and a half bath back there in the back corner of the property. So um, I'm happy to answer any and all questions. And again, our contractor, we've been working with uh, Taylor and his team for, for many years, uh, numerous iterations to try to find a solution so we can, um, just have one more bedroom. So we'd end up with a, a small two bedroom cottage. So I am happy to answer any questions. I've got lots of context for our very deliberate approach here. And again, our contractor can speak more technically to it. I'm not sure how they, since we haven't heard anybody uh, present by Zoom yet, not sure how that's gonna happen or if it needs to happen. Uh, Taylor, uh, last name Darling. Okay, yeah, so he's prepared to speak to all this as well in case um, commissioners need further clarification. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Um, do you, we, we come back to the deliberation. Other public comments. Other public comment, thank you. <laughs> Is there any? Um, Okay. Do I need to say something to it? <laughs> okay. You're welcome to speak now. Uh, can you hear me? 
There we are. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Taylor Darling. And uh, yeah, I've been working with Michael for a few years trying to come up with a, a solution for him and his wife to add one bedroom and a, a bathroom to their house. And we've been through a lot of iterations and run them by staff. And um, this, this seems to be the, the best solution that, that we can come up with. And just to give a little context that, you know, the house is very small. It's, it's only 625 square feet. And we are basically forced to do this variance because anytime you add more than 10%, um, you have to um, go through the variance and 10% and when you have 625 square feet is, is very small. So, um, nor, you know, a normal size lot, this project, um, you know, likely would not even need the variance, but um, this lot is so small. There's there's really no other place to fit any even small addition. There's a um, there's a setback in the back for um, sewer that constrains the the lot. Um, there there's just nowhere else to go. And um, I think what we're asking for here to to do a very small bedroom addition with a, a bathroom is, you know, it's as efficient as we possibly could have done it. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the, the parking, the width is is narrower than normal, but without demolishing the house and and moving it, uh, there's no other way to, to meet the parking requirement. So, um, yeah, we're asking for, for this variance uh, in order to do a, a pretty small addition on the back of the, the property. And, um, yeah, I'd be happy to ask any other questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So um, we can turn it back to commission for deliberation. <laughs> Does anybody wanna have any comments? I'll just go ahead and uh, move to approve staff recommendation. Second. Aye. 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 Good luck. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thanks, Doc. Okay, so the last item on our agenda tonight is uh, a discussion of the citywide housing element. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, this evening we have Brett Stinson of RRM Design and Veronica Tam of Veronica Tam and Associates Incorporated who are going to, um, Veronica is gonna lead the presentation this evening um, I'm excited to introduce these, the two of them. Um, there are, are experts in housing and we've got a big job ahead of us this year of adopting a new housing element, um, which needs to be adopted by the end of the year, by December 31st. And we'll jump right into it, but we've got a lot of units that we not need to figure out where they're going to go in Capitola in, in the future. And um, we've got a great team to work on this for us. So, to... <clears throat> so with that, Veronica, I'll let you jump in. Uh, great. Um, can, I, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. And you can see the PowerPoint. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, I'm just going to go quickly to give an overview of the housing norm and what we're doing, why we're doing this. Um, and for tonight, regarding the housing element, mainly we're going to focus on uh, 
some of the key uh, issues and challenges that we have um, facing in updating the housing element and what are the next steps that we need to do. Um, housing element part of your general plan is one of the seven mandated elements of the general plan, but it's very different in the sense that it has very strict uh, regulatory requirements. Uh, we have to look at the needs in your community, not only the current needs of your residents, but also project the needs in the future. It also has a very uh, uh, tight deadline. Uh, we are um, deal, dealing with December 31st, uh, 2023, as the deadline of the housing development. Unlike the rest of your general plan that usually have a longer time frame, um, the uh, planning for housing, the housing element has to be updated every eight years. What is also different about the housing element is that it has to be reviewed by a state agency for compliance with state law. The agency we're dealing with is the State Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD. And you'll hear about HCD uh, quite frequently uh, over the next few months. The housing element, as we mentioned before, that has these um, particular requirements, we look at the needs, we update the programs and actions that you're going to undertake in the next eight years, but it has to be reviewed by the state um, in, at two very critical stages. One, doing the draft housing element. Prior to adopting the housing element, you must consider comments provided by the state. And then after the adoption, we have to also let the state review the housing element um, as um, whether they would consider our overall the housing element be compliant with state law. And throughout that process, we will have opportunities for the public to uh, provide input on the housing element. Once you um, have adopted the housing element and certified by the state, um, implementation will be throughout the next eight years. Housing um, um, as I mentioned before, has very um, kind of like uh, statutory requirements in terms of the content. We need to look at the needs in your community, but we also need to look at the constraints and opportunities that you have in addressing those constraint, uh, those housing needs. We, when it comes to constraints, the focus is on governmental constraints, and we will talk about that later on uh, in future workshops. Uh, we also need to look at what you're able to accomplish over the last eight years, what works and what doesn't work in your community, and how do we modify it in order to provide for a variety of housing types in your community through the Housing Action Plan. So what has this really been able to uh, accomplish over the last eight years? You actually did quite a bit and, and, and a lot of accomplishments over the last eight years, particularly you updated the entire zooming code um, um, in order to accommodate mixed use into your commercial corridors. You have also adopted objective design standards for all multifamily mixed use development types. And then uh, you also have prototypes of ADU design so that it will be plan ready, uh, building plan ready, and easier for um, homeowners to pursue ADU construction. Um, you have also um, provided a, an ADU guidance document um, as part of the implementation of ADUs. Uh, you updated the inclusionary ordinance um, to provide updated um, housing impact fees in order to generate uh, resources for affordable housing. Uh, you have also implemented emergency shelter or emergency housing programs and rental assistance for lower income households. Uh, also provided rehabilitation assistance to some of your lower income homeowners. When we sent the housing element to the state for review, the goal is to uh, achieve something called a finding of substantial compliance with state law. It is very critical because the housing element is the most frequently litigated element of the general plan. When you do have a housing element that's deemed to be complying with state law by the state agency, then in the event of a lawsuit, um, you have the presumption of validity under, in, in courts. Uh, you also have um, the, the ability to pursue state funding, not only for housing, but infrastructure and transportation type of funding as well. <clears throat> when we send the housing out to the state for review, a critical component of that review is whether you have enough sites to, cobble, to accommodate housing growth in the future. If you're not able to uh, have enough sites to accommodate your regional housing needs allocation, which I will go into a little further later on, 
that would not get you housing compliance. But more critical is that whatever you're not able to accommodate, it would be an additive to the next housing element cycle. But if you're able to provide the sites, that's your obligation. Production is not the obligation. The housing needs or housing needs allocation is a production in terms of good faith effort, but it's not an obligation. Well, if you have a housing element that's out of compliance with state law, you would also see enforcement efforts from the state. Specifically, the state HCD has created a new division, Housing Accountability Division, which will be monitoring jurisdiction for the compliance and enforcement of the housing programs. Just a little bit about Capitola today. I think that before we start looking at your needs, some of the things that we need to kind of get an idea about is that currently your housing stock is generally split between single family and multifamily. You also have a fairly large mobile home stock, about 11% of your housing units are mobile homes. In terms of single family, 36%, but multifamily, that's apartment type of building is a little bit lower at 16%. So while there is an even split, you are also leaning towards more of the lower intensity type of housing. In terms of your current income distribution, when we look at housing programs, the state has defined income categories based on in comparison to the area median income. The five different categories that we typically deal with in housing elements, the extremely low, very low, low, moderate, and above moderate income based on comparison to the area median income, area meaning the county's median income. For Capitola, your income distribution is leaning towards a higher proportion in the moderate and above moderate income. About 63% of your households are between moderate and above moderate income. Another 37% or so are very low and low income. In the last 10 years or so, in terms of demographics, though, you barely increased in population by 20%. So not a very large increase at all. But in terms of your overall housing situation, you have also have more home ownership compared to 10 years ago, slight increase in home ownership. As we mentioned before, a critical component of the state's review of housing elements, the regional housing needs allocation, RENA, that is a top-down process from the state that estimate how much growth is needed in the entire state and allocated to sub-regions. In your region, the MBAC Association of Bay Area Government, Monterey Bay Area of Government. So that has about, I think, three or four counties included in that with 33,000 units overall allocation for the MBAC region. For Santa Cruz County, the overall allocation is 13,000 units or so. Capitola gets about 10% of that. Now, what is very important to also know is the fact that your regional housing needs allocation, RENA, for the six type of housing element is almost 10 times what you were allocated back in the fifth cycle. Due to a variety of reasons, one, the overall RENA for the entire state is significantly higher than in the fifth cycle. Two, there is a reason, there is a new state law that requires jurisdictions to look at the housing needs that from the past 20 years that have not been met. So you have to not only look at future growth needs, but you also have to compensate for lack of growth in the last 20 years or so. And then there are also new methodologies and factors that the state uses in order to calculate who, you know, the allocation of units. 
in again the regional housing needs allocation is divided into income categories uh, what is important to um, understand is it's not anticipated that you will have the ability to build all the units by these income categories rena is a planning goal not a production obligation and the state uses density as a way to estimate what type of land use policies or zoning would be able to allow jurisdictions to accommodate the house uh, region housing needs allocation by these income categories we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of the density um public outreach is a critical component of the housing element update already um, as well um, there is an ongoing uh, housing survey uh, to look at the needs in the community and this city has also conducted uh, stakeholder interviews um, there are also um, additional workshops that have been planned um, throughout these, um, the process of updating the housing element. Today is um, one of the first um, meetings that we will go through in terms of study sessions, but we will have another one with the city council next week and then a community workshop the following. So far from what we have done in terms of outreach, what we have heard a lot from um, stakeholders particularly is the need to streamline entitlement and permitting processes in order to encourage housing development. Um, there is also um, uh, critical um, ways to, to get housing built in the community is to work with nonprofits uh, in order to uh, provide housing that is uh, needed for your lower income and, or, and, and certainly persons with special needs in your community. Um, also opportunities for housing in, the, in, in Capitola uh, probably lies primarily in the mixed use area. Um, for example, in your Capitola Mall site, um, that um, probably would be one of the key uh, sites um, for housing in the future. In identifying sites, uh, the state has adopted a lot of new state laws to really regulate what constitutes feasible sites in uh, developing uh, housing for different income and for a different household type. What we have to do in the housing element is to make sure that we have we identify the site um, you know parcel specific and explain how these sites are feasible for development and whether there are um, there are access to infrastructure and services whether there are major environmental constraints uh, whether it will be able to facilitate a variety of types of housing including multi-family single family um, and also senior housing and other types of housing uh, we we absolutely need to identify sufficient capacity. Uh, without that, um, the housing element will not be certified by the state. So that is going to be a challenge in Capitola as a small community. And uh, what we need to do, uh, to do when we are looking for sites is to certainly respect the city's future, uh, the vision for the future. But in, in looking at that and in aligning with your current land use policies, uh, look for opportunities for redevelopment, uh, look for accessible uh, ADUs development, and look at some other um, opportunities such as state-owned um, uh, properties. And there is new state laws that govern um, housing, um, educational and religious institutional sites. Um, so that we can go into a little bit of that in, in the in a little later. Um, one piece of state law that uh, again um, that talks about site inventory for the arena is something the concept of no net loss when we as, um, identify sites in the housing element and make an estimate about how much growth can be a growth can be accommodated on those sites it may not actually happen exactly that way if the site is developed even when the site is developed and is developed at lower uh, density of fewer units than assumed in the housing element or not exactly at the, at the income level assumed in the housing element, the state requires the jurisdictions to do an ongoing accounting that you still continue to have the ability to accommodate your remaining regional housing needs allocation. And if you're unable to do that, you have to replenish your site inventory. And for that reason, the state actually recommends that when you identify sites in your housing element, you do create a buffer, you do identify a buffer um, between 15 to 30 percent 
uh, is a recommendation, but we try to um, to to get to that um, uh, as as feasible as possible. Um, particularly, the um, the buffer is important for the lower income categories because most housing developed at market is not going to be affordable for lower income households. Congregational sites and educational sites, there's been two um, changes in state law. Um, AB 1851 allows development of affordable housing for low income households uh, on congregational religious um, institutional properties. Basically, like, um, you can have a church um, or some other religious institution um, uh, on site, uh, but utilizing the uh, parking area or other unused area, and they can put, uh, provide housing on site, partnering with the um, religious institution. Um, um, they're not required to replace the parking that they, they took up to 50% of the original parking. Um, AB 2295, that's brand new. Um, uh, institutional, uh, educational and institutional um, uh, uses currently, uh, for example, um, public schools, colleges, um, they have the ability to uh, provide housing for their employees without requiring a zone change. Um, that is new state law. So when we're looking at the sites inventory, certainly one strategy is to look at your ADUs. Now, Unfortunately, uh, at this point, we, we, we're seeing an increase in your ADU trend, but it's not increasing um, um, at a very high rate yet. Um, but we are able to project based on the trend. Um, currently, we can project how many ADUs that you can achieve over the next eight years. So we can um, assume some uh, housing production uh, as ADUs in the future. We can also, as we mentioned before, look at um, the um, institutional uh, our religious facility sites. Um, that is a, a becoming a very um, uh, viable and very um, uh, popular trend um, right now in California is to have churches partnering with nonprofit developers who provide affordable housing. The example we're showing it here is in Garden Grove, uh, where they're taking about two, two acres of the parking lot area of the church site and then providing 47 uh, family housing and 16 units of senior housing. And in exchange for that, the church uh, gets a new community center, they get programs and offices um, um, uh, that, uh, that they're on site for the um, 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 for the re uh, for the residents, but then there are offices also for other local nonprofits. So um, this is one example, but there's been uh, many many examples now in in California. When we look at the site inventory, we you know given the magnitude of the arena, we really have to look at every. Um, um, corners of the city trying to find out what would be the most appropriate uh, places that would have the uh, either vacant or underutilized properties that we can facilitate um, or encourage uh, redevelopment. One thing is important to know is the state considers sites that are at least 20 units to the acre that can accommodate housing that's at least 20 units to the acre to be feasible for accommodating lower income. So as I mentioned before, um, the state doesn't and uh, doesn't expect you to actually build all the units um, at the, that the income distribution is shown in the um, MENA, but you do have to provide sites at appropriate density and development standards. And what is considered appropriate for lower income is about 20 units to the acre. So looking at the various zoning districts in your, in your community right now, you do have a few that do accommodate um, 20 units to the acre, um, such as your um, multifamily high density is close to 20. Your mobile home park, um, although um, it's um, we, we're not 
seeing a lot of new mobile homes um, to be redeveloped, uh, to be developed in these days. Um, you have the affordable housing overlay and the village residential overlay that's up to 20 units to the acre that would be, um, that can be used. You do have mixed use um, um, categories that have no density limit, but however, we do have to demonstrate to the state what is the trend of development in those areas, what is the average density yield. Um, so uh, with that, um, we're going to actually have to look at uh, um, possibly doing some kind of rezoning because what you currently have is unlikely to be adequate to accommodate almost 1,400 units of RENA. Um, when you do the rezoning, there is a deadline. The statutory deadline of the rezoning is December 31st, 2023. You, go, you can go past the statutory deadline, but, um, but if you're able to, to do the rezoning prior to the statutory deadline um, of the housing element and prior to or, or at the same time as adopting your housing element, is that you will be able to avoid a lot of restrictions or um, requirements that's imposed on the city if you end up having to rezone properties after statutory deadline. One key thing is that um, we talk about 20 units to the acre being a default density um, as being um, feasible for facilitating lower income. If you have to rezone after the statutory deadline, then not only do you have to have a maximum at 20 units to the acre, you also have to have a minimum of 20 units to the acre because you cannot have a zone district that has the maximum equals to the minimum. Therefore, your maximum will have to be pushed up to beyond 20 units to the acre. So most of the time when that happens, we the range would become 20 to 25 units to the acre or 20 to 24 units to the acre. Could you repeat that? I, I didn't follow your. Okay, follow that. so yeah, the the zoning district that you 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 uh, you need to or the zoning density that you need to facilitate lower income um, is twenty units to the acre. If you're able to rezone adequate properties to accommodate your lower income arena, you can have a zone that is says zero to twenty units to the acre. But if we're unable to achieve the rezoning prior to the statutory deadline, that particular zone cannot be zero to 20 anymore. It has to have a bottom of 20 units to the acre. So because you cannot have a zone that the bottom is 20 and the maximum is also 20, then you need to push up the maximum to be something else. So then your zone to accommodate your lower income arena would have to have a density range of 20 to 24 or 20 to 25, uh, 20 to 25 units to the acre. So the, 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 the maximum density of that zone would have to be pushed up because you now have to establish a minimum of that zone at 20 units to the acre. Okay, thank you. And there is also another requirement that um, the sites that you can um, qualify for lower income sites, even if you have the adequate zoning, the site has to be large enough to accommodate at least 16 units. So you cannot um, uh, include a bunch of smaller sites um, to, to accommodate your low income arena. You must find uh, sites that can be consolidated uh, to a point where at least 16 units can be achieved on those sites. Um, also, another thing that is critical is the by right approval. If the rezoning occurs after the start statutory deadline, then um, if a project comes in with 20% affordable to lower income, then the project would be um, eligible for by right approval and by right approval under state law is um, ministerial review uh, or no discretionary review, uh, no CEQA, no public hearings. So um, that's uh, the requirement if you are unable to rezone what you need before the statutory deadline. So Veronica, I'm just gonna take a moment and say, so we thought we just had to update our housing element, but this is a really a, a big piece so that we don't, we can avoid these other obligations. So mm -hmm. this, yeah. is, this will, will be, will be uh, going through and like, and 
just tracking these at the same time and hoping to have our densities updated by that December deadline so that we won't be subject to all these by right approvals and <coughs> other stipulations. So I just want to highlight that because that um, this is new state law that's come out and new requirements. So do, yeah. you, do you not only have to have the city approve it, but does it have to have Coastal Commission approval before December? It does. So um, I, I believe so. That That's a great question, but I'm thinking it has to be in place, so that means we have to have it certified by Coastal. So th this is going to be one of our first stops, Is and we'll get into this in, some, in the future slides, but is really looking at our densities and starting that process. Right when we thought we had an updated code, but we'll be coming back with modifications. Because we have areas without any density limits, and now we have to cover ourselves for, um, we should have density limits, because otherwise we'll be subject to the lower and upper ends of density limits. So, OK, continue. Thank you. Great. And um, another thing that is important um, to have the zoning um, done as well, uh, because we're most likely going to rely uh, heavily on mixed-use properties for your um, for your low-income arena, which essentially higher density uh, development. Uh, if the uh, if you don't have the zone in place or the site in place at the time then uh, rezoning to mixed use uh, to allow mixed use development requires that you allow standalone residential um, in those mixed use sites. Um, and that if a mixed use project does happen on the on those um, uh, mixed use sites, you cannot require more than 50% of the residential, more than 50% of the floor area to be uh, non-residential. That is if you rely on rezoning, and of those rezoning, more than half of your lower income comes from mixed use. Um, zoning. So that's another um, wrinkle that we have to um, um, deal with in terms of identifying sites and, and trying to strategize about rezoning. So with that, I'm going to pass it to um, Katie. She's going to run through some of the um, available sites um, and, and get your input on what those, um, what is the city's, what should the city strategies be? Katie? Thank you. Um, so here is the map that's included in our fifth cycle housing element, and it's identifying the, the previous RENA sites. And noted on here is the Terra Court um, development of 11 units on 38th Avenue, which shows is developed. And then also um, the entitlement of the hotel on Hill Street, which uh, we went through that, the <coughs> process of no net loss um, previously. So when we when we allowed the hotel, we had to find other sites to make sure that we could still fill our arena obligation. And we used the sites of 4401 Capitola Road and then another site on 38th Avenue right next to the rail trail or the, the rail. Um, so we're familiar with that action of having to have additional sites in order to allow different projects come in that don't quite meet the numbers we'll, we'll tie to arena. Next slide, please. So can I ask a question yeah. on that? So there's something that we're in the middle of approving or disapproving now, this high density thing on Capitola Road. So if that was a, if that was a part of our, one of our sites for high density housing, and as she pointed out, you have to constantly update to see, okay, so now it was developed, but if the density wasn't appropriate, then you have to have a buffer and say, okay, that wasn't enough, so now we have to find another area that will accommodate the higher density? Correct. So if in our no net loss for the hotel, we had placed, um, I'm going to say 20 units on the 4401 site, um, and if that application got developed at 10 units, we would have to find, for to meet the no net loss, we would have to find another site that could accommodate 10, the 10 units so that we can still meet our RENA obligation within the city limits. So, I, so the 4401 is the one that's the Capitola Road, the one we're talking yeah. about? Yeah. And so that, that, in fact, does meet the density allocation that you had assigned it when we did the hotel? I believe it does, yes. 
Because I would hate to it, think. It, it must. I, but I'll go. We'll make sure of that. Okay. Yeah, because sure. I think you need to make sure of that. <laughs> we do we need to make sure of that. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so this is uh, now, now thinking forward of where are we going to look at potential sites. So at this point, we have more public outreach. We've got our survey online. Um, we've, we did stakeholder meetings back in November. But we're also planning on the 16th to have a public, uh, a public outreach meeting via Zoom. Um, so we'll be getting that flyer out, I'm hoping by Monday, and circulating that. And we're letting the Planning Commission know and the City Council, and we'll be uh, getting that on our social media. But what we've heard in general so far from the stakeholder meetings um, is when we're talking about future sites, really looking at, and what our general plan has talked about, is looking at that 41st Avenue corridor. So on this slide, you're seeing um, the area in kind of the, the darker red peach color is includes the Capitola Mall and 41st Avenue north of Capitola Road um, and south of Capitola Road. So that's the regional commercial zone. And then south of Capitola Road is the um, general, is the community commercial. And one strategy we can utilize here is really looking at the whole zoning district and um, whether or not we want to take an approach of looking at the whole zoning district and assigning RENA numbers kind of uh, to, to any, to, to most properties that could be redeveloped due to their age and avail availability of open space on the lot. Um, another approach you can take in your RENA calculations is identifying kind of what we did with our last um, update is identifying very specific properties and allowing them higher densities and probably higher um, height limits to get there. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So on the 41st Avenue corridor, you're seeing the, these are the, um, so the north and south of Capitola Road site. So again, I just went over that, but the, those are the two zoning districts along 41st <laughs> Avenue, and really starting to look at mixed use there and the potential for more density all along within those zoning districts. Next slide, please. An another site that always comes up in these conversations, um, you can remember we had a um, conceptual review at the mall with 637 new units proposed and mixed use. When we're thinking about potential sites, we also have to think about um, um, incentivizing redevelopment. This is a huge site in which it plays a very important role with our commercial and future residential. So we don't want to overburden sites that really are in need of redevelopment. So there's going to be um, th there's going to be a lot of fine tuning to this because it's a huge site. It can hold a lot of housing. How we distribute the the differentiation of what types of affordability on this site, we really have to think be really thoughtful about because at the same time we want to make sure that the developer that comes in to redevelop the site isn't overburdened by um, or future housing needs here because it, it plays a very important role in economic development as well. So when you select a site, do you need to make sure that it is a candidate for uh, redevelopment soon? For example, you couldn't pick a site that was just developed and you know it wasn't going to get changed for another 30 years. You'd have to evaluate it and say this is like this is kind of old or dilapidated or whatever, or this was, how would you make that? So, so if we went, um, we'll take Terra Court for an example. Um, Terra Court is, it's a 11 townhomes. It's at two stories. If we were to take that to the HCD and say, oh, well, we, you know, this is our, in our incentivized zone and we'll allow them to go to five stories. They most likely are not going to accept that site. They're going to say, you developed that in the last, they're going to look at, for each uh, site, so they'll look at when they were last developed. Okay. So there's, they're really, they will be combing through this. So um, that site most likely would not make the list. Whereas the mall. Yeah, okay. Prime. But, okay, next slide, please. And then I'll let you take this one, Veronica. Anything okay. to add? 
Um, yeah, actually, um, um, great question from the plan commissioner. Uh, when you adopt a housing element, there is uh, under state law, you have to make a finding uh, because we're relying on underutilized sites, not vacant sites for most of our regional housing needs allocation. You, you have to make a finding that based on a variety of factors that we use in selecting the sites, that there is substantial evidence that the, the existing uses are not going to impede um, future development and that you have the ability to, um, to like that, that has the potential to be redeveloped for the next eight years. So that finding um, has to be incorporated as part of your adoption uh, resolution. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, the, uh, giving you an example of how you know we have to calculate um, capacity. This is a site that currently has three parcels and um, it's some CC um, and currently um, being used as commercial. But it's a single story uh, kind of commercial use restaurant and some other uses, but has very 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 large um, um, like service parking area that can be considered as underutilized. So if we were to um, rezone it and then allow for housing, there are many different ways that you can redevelop this. You can um, and you can just develop on the parking area. You can uh, incorporate the existing uses uh, to do adaptive reuse, or you can um, and you can build brand new things and then um, with existing uses moving back into um, you know the commercial space as well. But in Estimating the capacity, one thing we have to um, look at is realistic capacity. We, meaning that just because you zoned it at 20 units to the acre or 30 units to the acre, in this case, we just use the assumption of 30 units to the acre. You cannot, under state law, uh, you cannot just use the maximum density to estimate your capacity. You can only use uh, realistic capacity based on your trend um, to, to estimate capacity. At this, um, this particular example, a 1.5 acre site, um, at 30 units to the acre, if we were to redevelop the entire site, we estimate it based on only a 70% of um, um, achievement, like of average density, so about 21 units to the acre. Um, and so that would yield about 31 units. So every single uh, property that we estimate, we have to be, um, we have to take that discount factor based on the fact that currently very few projects in your city are developed at the maximum density. Um, and, and something that um, even for your commercial corridors, some of the commercial properties that says no maximum, um, if we can only demonstrate an average of 20 units to the acre, that's probably what we can use to estimate capacity. But I think most likely we're seeing um, a lower than, than 20 units to the acre in other commercial property. So that's something to, to keep in mind um, what we can. So it may be helpful to have um, actually a maximum and some kind of a minimum maybe um, in, in looking at um, density range at appropriate locations. So the good um, news there is yeah. we've got Capitola Beach Villas at 30 units per acre. Mm -hmm. So that, that helps us say we, we've, we've accomplished this in the past. Thank you. Right, but, but on the mixed use um, parts, what's our historical trend there? So that actually is a mixed use. That is considered, yep. oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that's a, okay, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Veronica. Okay. So I think um, what we you know, certainly want to um, hear from you is um, what are the primary issues uh, in updating the housing element that you, you want us to reflect in the housing element and also pay special attention to? What are the areas of sites that you think are appropriate uh, to be included in the site inventory? And there are um, any other con um, issues and topics that it's important for us to consider as part of the housing element updates. So. Can I, I have a question. So you, you talked about the site uh, that you showed us the potential site on Capitola Road, and it was 1.5 acres. 
and um, you were saying that that could equal 31 units. Um, does that take into account parking? Because the project that we were looking at on Capitola Road was 38 units, uh, I think on less than an acre, um, which is, you know, a higher density. I mean, I, I don't, I don't understand how, how it works. If it works in, you know, the scenario where someone can come in and propose something and they don't have to provide parking, but when we're proposing it in our housing element, do we have to provide parking? So, um, go ahead, then, then Kate, yeah. You can go ahead. No, I think um, when we look at the housing element, when we look at the sites, we, we don't know what developers are gonna come in and propose. We, um, they can do small units and get a higher density. Um, mm -hmm. They can get really large units, they can have density, but definitely the city does have parking requirements in, um, um, in most cases. And so what the housing element does, and when we estimate it, we try to be as um, conservative as possible um, so using an average density. Um, that would include parking, uh, providing parking as well. But that what we are estimating the potential based on average density in order to minimize the, the no net loss situation that you will um, um, experience in the future. So, but when actual projects come in, they can go higher, they can go lower. Okay, thank you. Our our next step here will be for we'll be analyzing. This, we'll be looking at the city at, at maps and looking at sites and bringing to you. You know, we'll be um, looking at the sizes of parcels, the ages of buildings, um, where they're located, and I think what we're really looking for tonight is. Um, we know there's a lot more study to be done, so we're not asking for specific sites. We just want to hear back in general, are you supportive of us looking at our mixed use areas? Is the focus on 41st Avenue where we've kind of put an incentive in our zoning code, would you like us to really focus on that, the commercial corridor, as well as looking at ADUs within our single families and also maybe revisiting the density limits within our multifamilies so that we're Kind of where we're headed, and then we'll be coming back with maps on specific sites and what we could really accomplish with that, taking that that first step. Um, in. So it, it'd be looking at our commercial centers and um, what capacities we could place for mixed use above existing commercial, <laughs> considering ADUs within single family and starting to project based on trends. And then also looking at our multifamily zones and the existing densities there and whether or not we'd have to increase the densities to get actual, to be able to um, say that those could be redeveloped. Seems like one opportunity we might have is we do have some multifamily projects in Capitola that are fairly old. Uh, and we have some multifamily projects that are in need of, um, you know, rehabilitation, like the fourplexes up on 46th and 48th. And um, I'm wondering if we can include some of those based on the age of those residential units that um, they're going to be needed to be redeveloped. I mean, I like the idea of the commercial corridor, but I think. We ought to look at everything. Yeah, I would think I wouldn't. I would be, be wanting to lean more heavily on what you just said, then rather than the commercial corridor. Just from a uh, former treasurer standpoint, I mean, we get our income from sales tax and TOT tax. So to start suddenly turning businesses into residential areas, it affects our bottom line. So. Um, yeah, I would tend to lean towards renovating existing multi-unit multi areas and increasing the density there. Right. But, but in the commercial area, I think we're talking about more of a mixed use, so the commercial would stay there. Um, we're not talking about reducing the amount of oh, commercial so space. Okay. 
we're talking about doing, you know, commercial and residential all in one project, similar to what they were proposing on the residential mall. Residential over retail kind of a thing. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. and I thought your comments about the mall are, are right on point because we absolutely want that site to be redeveloped because it is one of the big financial pieces that makes this city operate. And so we do have to be careful that uh, while we may give them a fairly large number of units, uh, trying to give them all lower, very low income units would be a real uh, deterrent for them to be redeveloping that site. So it's sort of a balancing act. Can I ask a very basic question, which is the RENA number itself? So from what I, what I understand is that Santa Cruz County was given this 12,800, whatever that, that number was, and that was just allocated, right? We didn't have any input that, was, that came from the state. Where did that, so that came, so let me just finish. So that came from somewhere, and then there was the, then that was allocated by AMBAG, I guess, and was split up by some equation, which I would like to see. Um, but so yeah, where did where did those numbers come from? Okay. So the state allocated certain numbers to each uh, metropolitan region. So AMBAG, we received thirty. Uh, we can't question those thirty-three thousand. So yeah, so the AMBAG we received thirty-three thousand. We can't really question that number. That came down from the state. We were assigned that. Um, if you could go back. So, so then at the <clears throat> at AMBAG, the board. Um, They've gone through multiple durations of how to how to uh, split those numbers up based on guidance from the state, and there's more guidance now than there has been in the past. So first off, the the number has tripled. The original number from AMBAG, I think the last round was probably around ten thousand. That number tripled. Um, then when they started uh, dividing up um, between. Santa Cruz, um, San Benito, and Monterey, the, they looked at different. Um, so was that, was that a political decision and we had representation or was, is that a hard formula? It's a, it's a formula that AMBAG and it's the board a accepted. It's a, it's a negotiated decision at the board. And we had rep representation on that AMBAG and we it's, felt that we had proper representation on that board. It's a negotiated decision, but it has to be approved by HCD. So there's Fair Housing Act is tied to it. Um, because we're a high resource city and we have a lot to offer in terms of schools and parks and uh, we've got great amenities that also uh, required us to take on more housing because we have something to, you know, we, we're um, a high resource city. Also because we're a high income city, we had to take on more than other cities. So it's interesting when you see the breakdown between uh, Capitola and Watsonville. Watsonville is much larger than us and it's a bigger city, it has a much higher population. And we're at 1,300 units, and Watsonville's at just over 2,000. Yeah, so it makes, so makes you wonder to what extent de existing density was was considered, because if there's no more room, then, like, Watsonville's a big place. Yeah. So was that part of the equation? Or, again, was this just a political negotiation? Or can we? is there an, equi an algorithm that we can look at and say, hey, here's an error here, like you did the other day on the uh, consultant's thing on the... It's like, oh, hey, they got a, they got a number wrong here. That's not the mean income of our families. That you know. So at this point, there's no changing these numbers. <laughs> it uh, it did go through. It, it went through the AMBAG process. It was appealed, and it those was. appeals did not <laughs> did not um, win. So uh, nothing. None of the numbers were re. Um, that ship has sailed. Yeah, so that ship has sailed. I am happy at any point, if you want to come in, I can break it down for you exactly how we were assigned our numbers. We were very active in this process. We wrote quite a few letters to the AMBAG board, um, and you're spot on in that it really did not consider our land area. Um, the only things that were considered really tied to land area were um, um, like fire, and sea level rise were two items of risk determination that we, some numbers were deducted for our city because of our close proximity to the water and flooding. 
and also, um, but, but fire, uh, other places such as Scotts Valley had numbers deducted for fire because they have more fire risk. So, right. um, but in the HCD's eyes, if, if you live in a dense city, that's, you know, and we're trying to decrease vehicle miles traveled and become more sustainable, that's where more housing belongs. So that, you know, that, that's really, when we say we don't have vacant space, they, um, it. But we also know we're not near a, a transportation corridor. So high density doesn't make sense unless we're in Santa Cruz or a high density transportation hub. But yes, right. so they, it's like, um, this is yeah, the we're place not. To argue that, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So that's where we're at now. But I'm happy to meet with any of you to walk through that. It's there's five different factors that go into the equation, and we, we did we did participate um, with letters from City Council to AMBAG during oh. that process, and we we sent in a letter against it, but we did not appeal, knowing that the outcomes of these appeals is has a, almost no chance. Okay, and can you, a question for you on the, about the community outreach and stuff that's been going on. Um, you know, like we all were at the last meeting, you know, talking about the project on Capitol Avenue. Um, how is that community outreach being handled? And, you know, can you elaborate that? Because um, I, I think that's where, you know, the, us as a community we need to talk about because like it comes all the way back to that project, you know, and then we talk about a specific project and then at that meeting, we all talked like our hands are tied from different standpoints, but it's all interconnected back to this. And so I think this is an overall, um, you know, educating our community of where we are and what the mandates are and where our hands are tied. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on how that's being handled in, in the past and going forward and, you know. Veronica, do you mind bringing up the slide of uh, Next Steps, I think it was, or Public Outreach? So. Right now, so we've had an online survey that's been posted, I, I want to say since November. So we're getting comments back on that, and we have it up on, on our website. We have a web page dedicated to the housing element update. Um, we did our stakeholder interviews. And right now, we're just, um, let's see, so in the continuing public outreach opportunities, this is really our kickoff tonight at Planning Commission, and we're doing the same meeting with City Council next week. We're one of three things, I believe, on the agenda. So it will really take the focus of that night. Um, and from there, so we're, we'll have a flyer that uh, gets posted next Monday, letting the public know that our first community workshop will be February 16th at 6.30 p.m. It's going to be via Zoom. I've talked to a lot of other community development directors in our region, and everyone's doing these meetings through Zoom. I guess it's been really well received that way. People can um, interact. like interact from home, and so it has been a successful forum. Um, the, community, the second community workshop will happen once we have, and correct me if I'm wrong, Veronica, but I think it happens once we have our first draft, and that's really when we expect, I think, the majority of the people to come out as we start identifying these sites, and it, people have more of a, a um, a relationship to their, you know, their home and where the sites are and relative to their home and parking and all of these things that we've seen. So I'm, I'm expecting the first work session to be attended, but um, I think once we have that first draft out, that's in, and that's what I've heard in the past, um, is that's really when the public will. How's your responsibility been so far to date, like with some of the outreach and the, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not asking for an exact number, but I mean, are you been in, yeah. happy with it? Um, so the the stakeholder interviews were well attended. Um, the, that was an invite. You know, we, we, we came up with, I want to say, eight different stakeholder groups from businesses to religious organizations to the school district um, to a resident group. So th those were well attended. Um, the... I don't know where we are in terms of how many people have filled out this survey, but I think that will get more traction as we get the word out about the February 16th meeting. Um, the storm kind of threw us back <laughs> on some of this. We were hoping to do the, the, these kickoff meetings back in January, and then the, that 16th <coughs> meeting um, would have fallen probably three, you know, three weeks behind our launch dates. But 
we'll we'll get it out there. We'll have uh, Chloe and Julia helping us post it on the website and get the word out to the public. But well, I mean, as we get uh, numerous emails about projects that we're just getting right now, I mean, that should be automatic in the beginning of making sure those people are very informed about being invited to the, the first round of meetings, right? I mean, like... Yeah, you know, we could add that to the bottom of our uh, emails for getting that messaging out there. But. And then um, another question, I mean, it's going to come down to a certain point, I think, right, at city council level, if I'm correct, you know, that we talked about, you know, mall development, um, you know, from the impacts of having tax revenue to having housing, right? And how that, you know, if that, if the community decides or city council under direction and it's going to focus that's on the 41st corridor or if it's going to go out to the multifamily, that's really going to come down to a, a decision that, I mean, it's going to be a why at a certain point that you're going to have to kind of design or give some guidance very strongly of what the mall or the 41st corridor is going to look like compared to how, if that, is a certain direction that we're going to keep those numbers low, then it's going to impact more of the community in other neighboring areas. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, we'll be looking at that. So I've got a question about your uh, how you're selecting these units. Are you sticking to the 28, 20 units per acre, or are you thinking, well, I'll do 40 units per acre over here, and then only, you know, how do you how do you select those sites? from a density standpoint. Uh, so you've heard from Veronica tonight, and earlier I introduced Brett. Brett is kind of specialized in looking at the maps and the GIS and all, all the layers underneath. And so he's gonna be the, our wizard in the background, <laughs> looking at the size of a lot, the age of a building, how much developable space is available on that lot, and starting to play around with densities. So, the, you know, we have to get to that, um, not only do we have to get to the, the special number of the 1300, I'd like to see us exceed that so that we can allow developments to come in that are under the, the requirements. So getting that number to probably 1500. So Brett's looking at, he'll be looking at that and being doing the wizard work behind with GIS. And that's what we'll be bringing to you um, is where, where they're, and as, um, you know, Veronica Tam has had a lot of experience getting approvals of uh, housing elements done in the past. So we'll be really um, leaning on their expertise and their guidance in this, and then working with our with the Planning Commission and City Council and the public to really get feedback of where to direct this. So it's going to be th those two elements of the experts knowing what sites are best, and then us knowing our city best and finding that balance between the two. Uh, it's, it's going to be a bitter pill for the is. community yeah. to swallow because, uh, you know, we're talking about adding 25% more to our town. And we're not talking about adding 25% more to our water supply, to our streets, to anything else. Right. And, um, you know, the, the, the character of Capitola has always been this sort of small beach community. And, um, uh, you know, the state sort of saying, you don't get, you don't get to have that anymore. Uh, we have decided that you need to be a different kind of town. And so it's gonna be, it's going to be hard, but it's going to be something, you know, we're going to have to do if we want to continue to function as a city because we live under state laws. Yep. Yeah, so, this, this will be a challenge. so there were, uh, it was reported, there were 109 municipalities, this is a question for Veronica, 109 municipalities in the state had to get, be approved by the end of January. Only 20 were approved by ACD. What, what are the consequences of not being approved? And then and the, the follow-up to that is, how do you get approved? If the, if the success rate is 20% or less, actually, like, well, yeah, what do you do? Um, that is certainly one of the challenges that we have to face. Um, the HPD's review of the housing element is extremely rigorous. Um, ultimately, they'll, um, they'll get approved, uh, it just may take time. And I'll give you an example, even in Southern California, 
SCAG region, that housing element was due uh, October 15, 2021. As of now, there are still less than 50% of the housing elements that's approved um, in the SCAG region, and they have 198 jurisdictions in the SCAG region. Um, a lot of times you need to go through multiple reviews with the state. Um, if you do get pat, if you do uh, not get certified by you know the deadline or the or the one hundred and twenty days that would allow you to do the rezoning, um, take a longer time to do the rezoning. Uh, you you just continue to work with the state, but in the meantime, you will not be eligible for state. Uh, funds such as the um, PLHA public um, uh, public housing, no public local policy and housing. I can't remember the, the acronym. PLHA um, is the funding that came from SB2 um, um, before, and and that's something that is um, you are entitled to receive it if you have a certified housing element. All you have to do is ask. Um, if you um, if you Oh, permanent local housing allocation, PLHA. Um, if you don't have a certified housing element, you will not be eligible to apply for that round of housing funds until you are. Um, there are other like housing trust funds, there are funding for ABUs, there are fundings for affordable housing development. Those you're just going to be not eligible until you do. Um, there is also the risk um, that you might have heard about um, builder's remedy uh, that if you don't have a certified housing element then you cannot deny a project based on the fact that they are not complying with your um, with your general plan of zoning um, um, policies so that's um, what builders' remedies are. You cannot um, you cannot um, deny a project based on using that finding. But our goal is to get to a, a an adopted housing element before the end of the year, before the statutory deadline. Which, um, if you self-certify, you're complying with state law, then you can avoid builders' remedy at that time. But ultimately, you want to continue to work with the state until you get to a certified housing element. Um, I, you know, and I, you know, Katie mentioned a bit um, before that, um, you know, I do have a very high success rate um, with getting housing elements certified. I believe out of the the 45 percent of the uh, the housing elements in the Southern California, um, at least 25 percent came from me. Uh, 25 percent of of the 45 percent came from our, my group. So we we, we do we we have we always have a way to get you there. Um, have a certified certified housing element. The um, the the um, point is. Well, taken that it is going to be a bit of hill, um, um, there are um, hard decisions that the Planning Commission and City Council have to make, um, and it's a matter of um, making also the state understand uh, your situation and try to come up to a, um, um, a negotiated um, um, kind of agreement on you know what can be what is within state law and that you you still have to do but what can be um, what can have some flexibility okay um, I think that wraps up our slide presentation I um, would would it be possible, I thought there was some really valuable information in the slide presentation for us to get a copy of that? Yes. Yep. Veronica already sent me a PDF, okay. so I will, I will send that up to you. Great. Um, Katie, did you want to look at the next steps slide? Oh, that would be perfect. And then we should, we do have one member of the public okay. here. I'm not sure if we have anyone on Zoom, but. For next steps, so this is the other, timing is everything, right, with this, to get it done in time. Once um, we, we'll be proceeding with the site's analysis and bringing that back to you, we'll be producing our draft housing element document and housing programs. We're hoping to have this to you as early as 
late March, early April. Um, so we can get our 30-day public review period started where we um, get this out <coughs> to the public and then we'll hold that second study set. We'll hold, hold a, st a study session and do some more public outreach at that point. After the 30-day review period, we have 15 days to respond to the comments. Um, and then we will send it to the HCD and they get 90 days to review it. So right there, we've lost four months. <laughs> A little, a little over four months. Um, and we are in February right now, so we've got 10 months. So, um, so HCD will review it. They have a 90-day period. And once they get comments back to us, we'll start moving through the public hearing process, which will be early fall, is what I'm, I'm expecting. We'll get the comments back probably at the end of the summer, um, having our public hearings in the fall, and then the statutory adoption deadline is December 31st. So that means that our... City Council has to have adopted the housing element update by December 31st, so. We do, we do have one member of the public. Should we ask, would you well, like to comment? One question on the schedule, Katie, while he steps up. The Coastal Commission review starts when in that whole process? So that would be a separate process. If we want to update our uh, density, and, and which we should, because then we're have protected. <laughs> That's a separate process. So typically from the time we, um, well, it's gonna be at least six months from the time that we start that with planning commission to the time, six months is optimistic for certification by the Coastal Commission. So I will, we will start plugging down the road because I, I think I'm seeing from the planning commission that you'd like us to try that. Um, the hurdles we can run in there is uh, related to CEQA, because as we go through this analysis, if we have, if we have any CEQA studying to do, or um, that also takes time. So, hi guys, uh, bear with me. I'm terrible at public speaking. Uh, to answer Peter's question, if I recall correctly, Kristen Brown was the president of AMBAG when. This was all done. So we had okay. the, a city councilor was the leader of the group that assigned these to us. So we, we really had that. Uh, I'd like to just talk about how serious the builder's remedy is. Uh, it hasn't been used a ton, but if we get to that point, uh, the groups involved these days, this is a whole new cycle, they are ready to use the builder's remedy, especially in towns like this. Uh, we are right on the top of the list. Uh, I'd also like to talk about trends and findings. Uh, she wants to get to 1500 because everything gets lowered. Uh, because we didn't build for 20 years, it's one of the reasons we have such a, a big number right now. And that means our trends are very, very low. Uh, and that's gonna make everything so much harder for us. Uh, and that's really all I would like to say. I would like to talk about the residential flex zone uh, on Portola that the county is going to do. Do we not like have the option to pull something like that off, or is it not useful to us? Or okay, well, that's all I got, guys. Uh, thank you so much, and really, uh, good luck. Uh, <laughs> I do not envy you. Okay. Oh, oh, just one, I'm sorry, one question. Can you, have we, um, when we're looking at this and everything, <laughs> have we heard anything from the mall developer, uh, anything recently or anything? Um, the, the latest from the mall developer is that they've been focusing their energy on a larger project, I think up in Al Alameda mm -hmm. currently, so where they have uh, much higher densities and height limits. So that, that's what I know at this point. Um, so we are, we'll be, in terms of the mall, we plan on as we start talking about the budget update for, for next, the bu next budget cycle, we'll be talking with our city council about our goals. And that's one item that I'm planning on bringing to city council is starting to talk about redevelopment of the goals and different avenues we can take in order to get there. So. Thank you. Okay, anyone have? Anything else on this item? Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. And this is going to be exciting. <laughs> thank Seems you, Brett like and Veronica.
Thank you. So where are we on our agenda? Uh, we're at the director's report. Do you have anything else? I just want to remind you that from here on out, our meetings are starting at 6 p.m. So <laughs> we'll see you here at 6 p.m. Uh, commission communications? If not, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.